Welcome back. In this video, we'll be changing up how we're currently doing our authentication and authorization. Currently, we're doing it all in auth.py. We're both verifying the token inside of some of these libraries that we're loading into the auth.py function, and then we're also actually checking whether or not the user info that we were looking at has a verified email as our authorization step. Now, that's kind of a loose authorization step, and we might want to add one that's a bit more substantive. So we'll do this with the authorization technique of using scopes and having scopes assigned to either users or roles inside of our API management console in Auth0. And then we'll check those scopes inside of our application but we're gonna move the authorization section over into recordsongvote.py. Specifically, we'll send it along from auth.py, whatever scopes we receive from the user, send it to our API endpoint, and then check for a particular scope at the very top of our handler here to make sure that before we execute any code associated with this API endpoint, that the user requesting that has the required scopes. So in order to get started with this, let's go over to GitHub. Make sure that you've downloaded the code for this course, and everything will be inside of 5.4 Checking for API Scopes. You can get the URL for this download up in the top of the screen here, or in the description for this video. Now once you've done that, make sure that you've gone ahead and downloaded it all on your machine and unzipped it, and we'll need to look at a few different files in just a moment. The first is Scope Check, which is a completely new file that'll check scopes inside of our user that are passed into it from the auth function. Now, we're actually going to check those scopes inside of the recordsongvote.py function. Now, this function is going to load in scopecheck.py and use it to check whatever information is sent to it from auth.py. And that's another file that's going to be having a few different changes. So let's compare how these files are going to differ from what we've just been working with in the previous video. Now, I'm going to copy the contents of our tilde, which is home slash downloads folder. In here, I'm going to get the folder that we were just looking at. I'm going to look for 5.4, which is the code for this particular video. And I really just want to compare the back end code because I'm not making really any changes in the front end code or anything else there. So let's copy that back end and let's copy that here into this current directory and let's call this back end 5.4. Now, I'm actually also going to need to add the recursive part of the CP command so that I can copy all of the different contents of that backend. So let's add dash R up here at the top. Now, once we run this, we should see a new folder here called backend 5.4. So let's compare some of these different files and see what we're actually changing. Let's start at the very top with auth.py. I'm going to select both of these and let's compare them. So you'll see that I'm actually removing a few things that we don't need anymore for what we were doing previously with setting up the user info request and checking if the user had a verified email. Now we could keep these in if we'd wanted to check both that the user had a verified email and that they have the relevant scopes. That's definitely something we could do. But because we're checking that they have the relevant scopes, that's going to be a little bit more of a stringent check. And I'm not as worried about whether or not they have the email as well. Now, I've just removed all the code on the left here that we were actually requiring to do this, like loading in the Auth0 domain so we could create this user info endpoint here for us to check, and also removing something like requests in order to actually make that request, gather that info, and then check it here in this check right there. Now, another thing that's changing, if you'll scroll down, is that we're actually now using the generate policy function a little differently. Specifically, we're using it to have these scopes. It was defined to have optional scopes previously, but now we're actually taking advantage of passing these scopes along to something called the context, which we can then pick up in the following functions like record songvote.py. Now, the other changes we're making that we're adding into this new version on the left are that we're going to require the ID token like previously, but we're also going to require that we see permissions inside of the ID token. Now this means that that's where the scopes are going to be held, and I'll show you where these permissions are actually located as soon as we change some things around in Auth0 so I can show you that in our bearer token. We're also going to say that when we see those permissions, we want to create a new variable called scopes, and we're going to join any of the values inside of permissions together with this pipe character so we can send it in as one single string, which is a requirement later on. Even if we have multiple scopes, we'll just keep them separated by that pipe character. 
Then, a little further on, we're going to add this new scopes section of the generate policy method. And we're going to go then all the way down to generate policy and create an entire policy for the allowing of that access to that API endpoint, but also passing along the scopes to the endpoint so that it can then do the authorization check. So we've already authenticated our user inside of auth.py all the way at the top here. But then the authorization check is whether or not that user has the permissions then to take some action. So this will make sense a little bit later on when we actually see how this works. But this is the big change that we're making here. And we could go ahead and replace the existing auth file just by dragging this over. And I'm going to click move and replace. So that's that first file that we're replacing. So next up, what happens in record song vote? That's different from what's in the next version. So let's go ahead and compare these two. Well, this is a much easier comparison because if you scroll all the way down, really I just have this additional new line that I forgot to clean up and these two other lines right here. The first line is gonna import the scope check function from the scope check file. We'll take a look at that in a second. The second change down here on line 10 is that we're using that file with the event coming in and we're saying that we have required scopes that we need in order to continue on. Specifically, we wanna see this write votes scope, which is going to allow us to vote on the API endpoint. If we don't see the scope, it's gonna fail out for us. Now, the reason we're passing in the event here is because actually the event is gonna contain that information from auth0.py when we pass it in using the generate policy function that we'd written lower in that file. Now, it looks a little confusing because it's saying we're passing it into the context, but actually when it gets loaded in in Python, it's actually present in the event. So sorry about any confusion there. That's just how AWS Lambda handles passing that through with Lambda authorizers. So let's go ahead and replace this file too now that we know what the difference is. I'm gonna go ahead and move that and replace it. And let's look at the last file that differs because it's not really present right now in any of our code, which is this scope check file. So what does scope check do? Well, it's gonna get the event inside of our Lambda function. This is gonna be the plain bare bones event. And it's also gonna get a required scopes section here, which by default is gonna be none. Now, once it gets the event, first it's gonna say, if there's not any required scopes, it's gonna fail out and say, you didn't specify any scopes. So we don't want anybody to inadvertently use the scope check thinking they were doing something more secure and not providing any scopes. So this will prevent us from inadvertently giving permissions we didn't mean to. And then we're gonna check whether or not scopes are actually present in the event request context. And if they're not, then it's gonna say you didn't provide any scopes and it's gonna fail this as well. Finally, once it does actually have cases where it has provided scopes, it's gonna set that as this provided scope variable here. And then it's gonna eventually check how this provided scopes looks. If it's set up as just a single string, then it's gonna take a look at those scopes and compare it to the expected values. So let's say coming in, the provided scopes from the event are something like write votes. It's gonna say, are the provided scopes the same as the required scopes that we're actually checking for in record songvote.py, like right there. And then if it does see that they match and everything's good to go, then we don't have to worry about it. But let's say you have multiple scopes that you wanna check. So you wanna make sure that the user has the right vote scope and some other scope. Well, in that case, it's gonna do a little bit more work and it's gonna make sure that in the case where the scopes coming in are actually a list of required scopes, well, it's gonna split up the provided scopes that come in with that pipe separator that they were joined together with inside of auth.py when we were sending those scopes in together and joining them with the pipe. Then it's gonna say, okay, are all the required scopes present in the provided scopes? In that case, this should pass. Otherwise, the scope check failed for some of the required scopes. So hopefully this isn't too confusing. And let's go ahead and move that scope check into our backend here too. So now that I've done that, I should be able to just delete the backend 5.4 folder here. And let's move that to the trash. And I'm gonna clear the screen here too. Let's go ahead and close out scope check as well. So the next step here is actually deploying this backend. So let's go ahead and do serverless deploy. And what this will require from now on is any user making this request through the front end is gonna need a bearer token that contains the appropriate permissions. 
and they're going to still also need to be a valid token. So they can't just fake the appropriate permissions on the front end because we're sending them through auth.py and auth.py is verifying that token. And then we're sending them along with their permissions over to the record song vote function, which then checks to see whether or not the scopes that they have are present in the required scopes for this endpoint, the right vote scope. So let's take a look at how this gets generated in our front end. I'm going to change directories into our front end now while this is deploying. And I'm going to run python 3 m HTTP.server just to start up a local server with our front end. Now, at localhost 8000, we should be able to see this. So let's go ahead and open that up in our browser here. Now, currently, it looks like it copied the last parenthesis here that I don't need. So I'm going to remove that and hit enter. And I'm also going to change this from 0000 to localhost here. And this should allow me to actually use the Auth0 setup. Now, right now, what happens when I click login and login with Google is we saw the same process before. When we go to inspect and we go to the console, we have that Auth0 client here that's all created and we can use it. So let's go ahead and get something like our ID token here. And I've used this before, so it's all saved for me, fortunately. And let's console.log our ID token. And this is all that gibberish that we know contains some goodies that we need to actually make calls against our API. So let's go ahead and go over there now. Let's check out jwt.io and let's investigate these goodies. Let's decode this over here. And currently you're seeing no permissions inside of this payload, right? Well, we actually need permissions to be there in order to access this API. Now let's try testing this out and see if this fails as expected. I'm gonna do a hard refresh of this page to make sure it's loading everything in new. And then let's try this login one more time. Click login with Google. And let's try voting and seeing if it works. So it looks like I clicked the vote button, but we're actually failing this request now. And if we went and took a look at the reasons for the failure, I guarantee you that it's related to the fact that we're not passing these scope checks anymore. So how do we fix this? Well, to fix this, we need to get the scopes added into our JSON web token. And we'll do that inside of the Auth0 dashboard. Now there's lots of ways to set up scopes and have them protect your APIs. And inside of Auth0, you could do that in many different ways. You could have an entire management application that when maybe a user is added to your application, they could create some sort of organization, add other users, and maybe those users get permissions to take actions on their account specific things. But that's a whole kind of other world of technical specifics for whatever application you're building. But if you just want to add scopes to a user here, you could click on the user itself inside of users, and you could go over here to the view details section. And inside of here, you can either set up permissions or roles. Now, roles, if you don't have any, could have scopes with them. So let's say I set assign roles. I don't have any right now. But if I wanted to create a new role, let's call this a voter. Let's give it a serverless jams voter as our description. And let's save this here and go over to permissions. So all of these permissions would allow us to specify which APIs we actually want to get permissions on. So let's say the one we're currently using with just this API v2. Now currently there's no scopes available, so we'd want to add the scopes on this API. So let's go ahead and close out of this as well, but we've created this role for later. And let's go back to this API. Now, this is the one we're using right here because it matches the identifier with the identifier that we're seeing in serverless.yml. And if we scroll down, there's the option to turn on something called RBAC settings. Now, these are role-based access control settings. Now, if we enable these here, we have the ability to just enable these in general for the API or also to add permissions in the access tokens of users. And we need to do both of these things in order to get everything working. So once you've clicked on both of those and made sure they're enabled, hit save for your API. And then let's go ahead and go over to permissions. So what permissions would we want this API to use? Well, we just created one inside of our application. So let's go back here and make sure we're copying it identically. We need to know that this write votes is gonna be used on our application. So let's describe this here and say, in order to vote, used in order to vote for songs. Let's say that right there and hit add. 
And now we know that this permission is going to be usable on this API in general, but we still have to say for a particular user, we want Fernando, the user that is just signed into this application right now, to be able to vote. So let's go ahead and go back here. And again, we could do this two ways. We could do it through permissions and we could say for serverless jams API 2.0, we could say write votes and add permissions directly to this particular user. Or if we probably wanna have a little bit more control and doing that on lots of users whenever we want, we could just use roles in general and have this voter role here. Let's go ahead and view the details of it and change the permissions for this API, we could say that any voter has the right votes permission. Now this way, if we have, you know, another 12 permissions that come up that we want the voter to be able to do, maybe write votes on one particular endpoint and write votes on another endpoint, this would help us keep track of all those different things without having to go back to one particular user like Fernando and saying, hey, we need you to update your permissions for all of these different things. So we could keep this here or we could trash this and give Fernando a role of a voter. So let's assign that there. So now Fernando has this role of a voter and we know that the role itself, if we look at it, let's go ahead and view the details, has the right votes permission. Also for our API, we went ahead and in here set up the RBAC settings to enable RBAC and add permissions to the access token. With all of these settings done, we should be able to go back to this application and log out just to make sure that we're getting a completely new token. Log back in, log in with Google, and then do the exact same thing I did before where I said the ID token here and then I log the ID token. And I'm gonna copy this and go back to this JWT website so we can see what's in it. And you'll see now we have this new permission section here with right votes inside of it. Now you're thinking, okay, well, what if somebody decides they just wanna fake this and encodes it so that we can send this right votes permission in there? Well, remember that our code still actually verifies this entire token because there is a signature that'll allow us to cryptographically ensure that nobody's faking it. So this is where the next part comes in, where inside of our application, it's gonna go through and do that verification. So let's try voting one more time. I'm gonna do Coderitis, because it is my favorite song out of these, and it looks like it was successful. We went up from 38 to 39. I'm gonna vote a few more times. So it looks like it's still working, it looks like it's being recorded, and if I hard refresh the page, it looks like those votes are still here. So this means that we've successfully implemented scope checking in our application. And you could do this for your own applications. Just keep in mind that there's a lot of different configuration settings inside of Auth0. You could set up rules to automatically add users to a particular role whenever they're added. And there's a lot of different options here that you could pick. The problem is what sort of Auth0 access do you wanna use and how do you wanna use it in your service? I can't anticipate that for you, but hopefully this scope check will help you figure out how you could actually code this in your applications. So congratulations, you've just implemented scope checking inside of your front end application. Feel free to go ahead and use any of these code samples in this course to help jumpstart your own applications. Also feel free to ask comments or questions of me on Twitter. You can find me at FMC underscore SEA. Thanks for your time and best of luck learning more.